Hey guys and welcome back, or if you're new here, hi, welcome, my name's Georgia and on my platforms from the internet I focus on unsolved true crime, missing people, murdered people, unidentified people and today we're going to be talking about the 1970 disappearance of 17 year old Helen Claire Frost. This is a case which has been requested a lot over the years and despite Helen going missing almost 53 years ago, her family are still desperately searching for answers, so any awareness for Helen's case is greatly appreciated. Her family just want to know what happened to her, there's not been a single clue in all of these years and 53 years is a long time to wait. Helen was born on October 17th, 1952 in Reigate here in England. She was the second daughter to her parents, Dennis and Daphne Frost. Dennis was actually a Green Beret in the British Commando Brigade and he worked on the docks in London throughout the war. But now the war is over, the family needed a new start. In 1956, when Helen was just four years old, they packed up all their belongings and moved to Nanaimo in British Columbia in Canada. The family was said to be close-knit, stable, there were no big issues growing up. Sandy, the oldest daughter, and Helen's older sister described their parents as good parents, despite the headstrong actions of their two rebellious teenage girls. Dennis and Daphne would be married for 67 years until Dennis's sad death in July 2014. Their two daughters, Sandy and Helen, had always been fiercely independent, even though Helen has been described as much more of an introvert than her sister. But literally from the age of 14, the sisters would travel across the province to go and work in Abbotsford for the summer as berry pickers. And then the next summer, when Helen was just 15, they went even further. They went all the way to Penticton, but things didn't really work out with the job they intended to get, it just never really materialised. And so they just spent most of their time hitchhiking and sleeping outside. They were teenagers on an adventure. It seems so young, doesn't it? But they didn't think so. And this does go to show that Helen wasn't afraid of putting herself in what would be considered now as dangerous situations. Sources really seem to differ about the timeline in the year before Helen's disappearance, but according to Laurie Culbert for the Vancouver Sun, it seems that when she was 16 in 1969, she moved to Prince George all alone. That's an 11 and a half hour drive north of her family home. At this time, Helen would have been about three months pregnant and I don't know if she knew that, I don't know if people around her knew that, but she was pregnant. And she got an apartment on the 1600 block of Queensway. When Helen came home to visit her family in November 1969, Sandy decided that she was missing out. She decided she wanted to move in with her younger sister. So she just hopped on a bus back to Prince George with her. Now Helen was pregnant and so was her roommate Darlene, so Sandy moves in with Helen and Darlene. Whilst in Prince George, Helen worked a number of odd jobs to pay the rent, just anything that paid, and it seems for the most part she was a busser at the Hudson's Bay Company cafeteria. So as I said, in autumn 1969, Helen had fallen pregnant with her boyfriend, Stefan. She was still a teenager at this time and I have no doubt she was terrified when she realized she moved to Prince George when she was three months along. Now this was 1969, 1970, it wouldn't have been a particularly kind time for young unwed mothers. And so in the spring of 1970, Helen went to a home for unwed mothers in Kamloops, where she gave birth to her daughter, Sandra Jeanette, on May 13th. She named her daughter Sandra after her sister who'd supported her throughout her entire pregnancy. These sisters were so close. However, soon after birth, Helen was convinced to give Sandra up for adoption and Sandy said of the situation. She had a welfare worker and they went to the hospital and they talked her into giving the baby up for adoption. Helen didn't want to give her daughter up, but being a teenage girl, she was convinced it was the best thing to do for her daughter's sake. And so she agreed and Sandra was taken immediately into government custody. Sometime soon after this, Helen realised that she'd made a mistake. She wanted her daughter back. One day that summer, the sisters took a trip to visit their parents, but on the way made a detour to Kamloops to go and visit the social services office. Sandy said that Helen went in and had a meeting, but came out the offices hysterically crying. And then they just never spoke about it again. Helen struggled to come to terms with the situation as anyone would do. She was devastated at losing her daughter. 
At some point after the birth, Helen and Stefan, the father of the baby, broke up, and then Helen found a job with a painter. She actually left Prince George for a couple of months over that summer to go and paint gas stations along Highway 16. When she returned back to Prince George in the October, Darlene, the roommate, had had her baby too, and the baby was now living with them. No doubt Helen would have found this incredibly difficult with what she'd had to go through, but she never complained, she seemed to just get on with it. Sandy has said that those lost months where Helen was just gone travelling down Highway 16 might be the missing piece of the puzzle, but they don't know what happened, who she was with in that time. On October 13th, 1970, Helen left her apartment to go for a walk. Now, this was just four days before her 18th birthday, and Sandy said that she'd been out for a coffee with a friend and she returned home around 8pm. When she got home, Helen asked her if she wanted to go for a walk with her so they could talk, but Sandy said it was too cold, she'd only just got back, she really didn't want to go out again, so she declined the offer. At about 8.20pm, Helen headed out for what she said would be a quick walk alone, and then she just never came home. Sandy must feel so much remorse, wondering for all these years what Helen wanted to talk about on that walk, but she had no way of knowing that that would be the last time she would ever see her sister. There's no way to know something like that. It took Sandy a couple of days to report her sister as missing. She said that when Helen didn't come home, she just sort of assumed that she'd met up with a friend or gone to somebody's house. She wasn't immediately concerned. Helen was very much a free spirit. She was very independent and this was 1970. They didn't have smartphones they could use to immediately check in. There sort of had to be this level of trust and that people were safe. But when Helen didn't return home by Thursday, October 15th, Sandy reported her as missing to the RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Helen Claire Frost was 17 years old when she disappeared, but she would be 70 years old today, soon to be 71. She was a white female, 5 foot 6 and 100 to 125 pounds. She had short blonde brown hair with blue eyes and a fair complexion. Since birth, her left eye had never opened as wide as her right, giving it a very slightly droopy look. When she left the house for her walk, she was wearing a three-quarter length navy blue nylon coat with a fur-trimmed hood and blue slacks. At the time of her disappearance, the RCMP did take a statement from Sandy, but she didn't believe at the time that they took it as seriously as they should have, maybe because Helen and Sandy had partaken in risky hitchhiking behaviour in the past. So Sandy and one of her male friends took it upon themselves to do some investigating. They went searching, they asked around and discovered from a truck driver that somebody of Helen's description may have hitchhiked south from the Husky gas station in Prince George. However, this lead has never been verified by the police. According to Sandy, Helen had run away before, but there was no sign that that's what had happened here. She'd asked Sandy to come with her, she left behind all of her clothes, her money and her ID. She said she'd be back soon. It is possible that Helen was suicidal considering everything she'd been through that year. She may have found it very, very hard living in that apartment with Darlene and with the baby. But again, there's no actual proof of that. There's no evidence of anything in this case. There's also no evidence to suggest that Helen was involved in drugs or crime. She wasn't an addict of any kind, but she was known to partake in hitchhiking. But then again, most young women at this time did. The sisters' apartment on Queensway was just a few blocks from some pretty major highways. It was just nine blocks from Highway 16, which you might also know by the name the Highway of Tears, a 719 kilometre stretch between Prince George and Prince Rupert, on which a number of violent crimes have been committed since 1970, mostly against missing and murdered Indigenous women. There are a disproportionately high number of Indigenous women on the list of victims of the Highway of Tears, and I do have a whole episode on that which I'll link down below in case anyone is interested in learning more. The number of people included on the Highway of Tears victim list is very much up for debate. Most Indigenous organisations estimate there are more than 40 victims on the list, whilst the RCMP say it's fewer than 18. The RCMP did actually launch a provincially funded project called EPANA in 2005 to look at these crimes on the highway to sort of discover if this was the work of a single serial killer or a number of different killers and that project is still running to this very day. If you look at unofficial lists of Highway of Tears victims, and I say unofficial to mean not the RCMP's list, 
you will almost always see Helen Frost's name included on those lists. She fits the vague outline of the victim. She was a vulnerable young woman last seen in the area of Highway 16. As Sandy has said, she had things in common with those girls and women. She hitchhiked. She was in a mental state which could set her up to a predator. I guess she was fairly easily led at that point. She was 17. Helen, of course, was not indigenous. She was actually British, but she very easily could have been part of the minority of non-indigenous victims. And if so, she would have been one of the very first victims of the Highway of Tears. However, Helen's name is not included as a victim by Project Epana, and whilst I couldn't find any solid confirmation as to why, it may be because there's no confirmation that she met with foul play. The criteria for inclusion on Project Epana's list is a female victim engaged in a high-risk activity such as hitchhiking or sex work, who were last seen or their bodies were found within a mile of Highway 16, 97 or 5. So Helen very much should reach that criteria, but for whatever reason, they don't include her. Sandy's been fighting now for a really long time to get Helen's name on that sort of official list in air quotes. She's convinced that her inclusion would lead to more publicity, more public awareness. And Sandy said to the Vancouver Sun, I don't know if she's a part of all those women or not, but why not include her in that big group? because maybe her photo would come out a lot more. If she was part of the Highway of Tears, there'd be more publicity. She is just as missing as they are. She's from the same area. However, Helen not being included on the list does not mean the RCMP aren't investigating her case. Or at least I suppose the latest update I have is Vancouver Sun article by Laurie Culbert from 2014, where Constable Gary Godwin has said there's not enough evidence in this case to determine whether Helen committed suicide or is a murder victim. He said, at this point in time, we just don't know. I think we still have it as a mysterious disappearance and we don't know if there's foul play. He confirmed that they revisit the missing files on a continuous basis and it's always good to keep getting information out there, but they just don't have much to go on in Helen's case. I do suspect that Sandy's suspicion is correct and the RCMP didn't really do much, if any, investigating in those early days and as we know, those are the most important days. They did release an age progressed photo of Helen aged 52, so this was a few years ago now, and Sandy has hoped that modern technology would eventually provide answers for her, but so far, there's nothing. One silver lining in this case though is that Sandy has always said that she's been looking for two people for all these years. Helen, obviously, but also her niece, Sandra. And whilst Helen's never been found, Sandra happily was, although now she's called Michelle Johnston. In December 2017, knowing she was adopted, Michelle decided to request her original birth records to start the search for her birth mother. And she received those records in early 2018, seeing that her mother was called Helen Claire Frost. Upon deciding to Google her, as is naturally the next step, Michelle was shocked to see that a girl by the same name was a missing person. She very much hoped that it was a different Helen Frost, but everything matched up, the timeline and the fact that she had a baby on Michelle's birthday. But the final clincher was that Helen undeniably looked just like photos of Michelle when she was young. From there, Michelle came across a Facebook page dedicated to Helen, run by Sandy and family friend and Gavin, and on there she found a phone number. Michelle decided to call it and spoke to Sandy, saying that she thinks she's her niece. And from there, they went on to reunite, meet in person, and it's all been very bittersweet. Obviously, Sandy is overjoyed to know her niece, to know Helen's daughter, but it's difficult as well. I mean, Helen's baby meant the world to her. She was devastated to have lost her. If Helen was out there somewhere alive, if she decided to just leave and start anew, however unlikely that may be, she would have come forward to meet her daughter. There's no doubt about that, but she hasn't. It seems that for Sandy, this is a very clear indicator that Helen's no longer alive. Something happened to Helen Frost on the night of October 13th, 1970. Whether she decided to end her own life somehow in a way that her body has just never been found, or she came across somebody with nefarious intentions, something happened to her. Maybe she did decide to get away and hitchhike, but she was just supposed to be going on a quick walk with her sister. Why would she get in someone's car unless she potentially knew the person who stopped? But then again, she was very upset. She wasn't in a good headspace. Maybe she would have got in the car with somebody who offered. 
If you have any information regarding Helen's whereabouts, you can contact the RCMP Serious Crime Unit on 250-561-3300 or Crime Stopper 1-800-222-TIPS, both of which I will also leave down below. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Thank you for choosing to spend this time with me and more importantly with Helen. Thank you for choosing to spend this time to learn her story. Again, if you have any information whatsoever, then please do contact the RCMP. And I guess I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.